Yeah, so um, that's my first day, it's your last day. Um, it's all gonna be about how to publish research data. I hope you all had a good week. Um, could already see in the morning that you had a very engaging week and learned lots. Um, the program is slightly different than what you saw originally because the second block was originally um, flagged as also how to retrieve data via um, R and Python from Pangea. But I realize it's very specific. So if you use different repositories, it's all different workflows. And because the theme of data publishing is so big, I, I could easily fill and need these two blocks. So it's all gonna be about how you can publish your, your research data. Um, I also gonna have uh, a colleague of mine in the back, Lars. I'm not sure if he's already in the, I hope so, <laughs> can't see him. Um, He's gonna. He's an, a bigger expert than I am because I just joined in uh, April this year. So I'm a data curator since uh, April 2022. Um, and Lars uh, will also help me out in terms of questions. Um, if you have very specific questions, you're also gonna back me up. Yeah, so that's gonna be the, so let's start with the first block. Um, just uh, general, like general information, not sure what you agreed on in the past days. I like to have, uh, or would be best if you have a microphone turn off, which you already have, um, until unless you want to you want to talk or you want to say something. Uh, but please keep your cameras on. It's nice to have some visual feedback, um, and not just seeing myself. Um, if you want to, it's not a must, but would be would be great. Um, if you have any questions, I would prefer to actually, if you could post it on a Jamboard, um, because if, there are, if there's a long chat, it's just a bit hard to follow up which questions are, are still relevant. So I prepared a Jamboard, which I post in the chat. So have a look. And it's basically just going to look like this. I'm not sure if you already worked with a Jamboard before. You can just um, have a note and say something and then just uh, post it. And then it's here. So we have like a nice collection of questions. And after the block, we basically have a question and answer session where we can just respond to that. Or if someone else in the group has already an answer, post it there as well. That's fine. Yeah. And it was maybe already mentioned that the slides are going to be available on Zenodo right now. Daniel. So um, you don't need to take screenshots all the time or take notes. Um, it's all going to be available especially because the links which are embedded in the presentation um, are, would be relevant for you as well. So that, that's, that's a nice thing then. Um, so expectations, I strongly believe in learning by doing. So there's a nice, a proponent, a nice quote um, from, apparently from Confucius. Uh, he said, I hear and I forget, um, I see and I remember, I do and I understand. So I try to embed as many practicals as, as possible. Um, because first of all, not because I'm also just lazy in terms of talking too much. Um, I think it's also just more fun to do something instead of just um, and sitting in front of a screen. Um, yeah, so then just showing you, giving a short overview about the, the first session in the morning today. So introduction, which we just write in. Uh, then a short quiz, why we should publish data, where I just want to get some um, feedback from you. Then I'm going to give you my idea of why it's important to publish data. Um, the next section would be um, where to publish data, which is uh, actually quite a challenging thing to do to find the right place to publish your data. Then a practice in terms of finding the right repositories, short break, and then another practice in terms of what data publications actually can look like. Um, and then the block length concludes with a short, uh, some short slides about persistent identifiers. You already cut this topic a bit in the morning uh, regarding ORCID. So that's going to be a relevant theme today. Um, and at the end, some questions and answers. Um, the second block today from 10.40 to 12, it's going to be how we publish data, uh, which uh, is accompanied by some practice uh, about uh, repository requirements. Then um, an overview about data structures or proper data structures and um, some ways how we can improve our data quality with uh, data collection methods. Then Data curation, a very important thing because I'm also a data curator, so I'm doing this every day. Um, and then based on that, having two practice sessions attached to that, how to detect certain issues with data um, and also how we can fix those issues and a data curation practice in Jupyter Notebook. Um, then after that, we have an exercise in submitting data. And at the end, uh, 
how to cite our data properly very shortly. And at the very, very end, some last questions and answers. So um, I don't need this anymore. We did a great job, so I can skip that. Um, Pangea, you also introduced already. So again, we uh, I work for Pangea, or basically I'm between Pangea and NFTI for biodiversity, working at both sides. Um, and about 70% of my daily job is to, to upload archive data, curate them, um, communicate with scientists um, to really to make sure they have really high quality data publication out there. Um, yeah, we're mainly dealing with environmental data that originally started with more um, geological data, but we uh, Pangea kept expanding over the past 20, 30 years um, in a really broad direction. And now we're also accepting also via NFTI for biodiversity, a lot of terrestrial data. Um, so it's really expanding its scope. Um, and Pangea is actually one of the oldest data publishers. And I think one of the first, and maybe not even maybe the first actually, who had DOIs for data sets. Um, so that's um, um, so we quite spearheading that, that field. Um, yeah, so that's that's about Pangea. Um, in terms of NFDI for biodiversity, I'm not sure if you mentioned that. Um, so apart from uh, the general of NFDI for biodiversity of, of bringing together many institutions and museums and history societies and all that to work together and work on common standards for data publishing, um, NFDI for biodiversity also has a couple of data centers um, which um, actually actively publish uh, data. So Pangea is just one data center among many others that are under the umbrella of NFDI for biodiversity who are connect to that. Um, and uh, the German Federation of Biological Data, I'm not sure if you talked about this as well, is basically provides a platform to link these different data centers. Uh, so basically you can also submit your data via um, GFBio and then in the background, you would basically direct your data to different data centers and, 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 the, and help you how to find a good match. So the learning goals for today would be, so after the session today, or the two sessions today, you should know why it's important to share and publish research data. Um, you should also know where to publish data, how to prepare your data for publication and how to, how to publish and, and cite your data. So that's at the end of the day, what we want to do. So publishing data has benefits at different levels. So it has, has benefits at a societal level, benefits for the research community and also particularly for you as a researcher. Uh, and it's it's basically addressing a lot of different aspects. Um, as you already mentioned, like, you know, this um, makes research transparent and um, it's tax, tax money. So we also have, have an obligation to do that and it's, uh, it's making our work more visible and all these kind of things. So I will start at the, in more detail about the societal level. So why is it important to publish data for society? Um, so, First of all, it benefits the public purse. It's, it's basically saving money uh, because we reduce the, the repeat work for of, of research. If you don't know what has been already done, um, we can we potentially do research which was already performed in the past. So that's that's a waste of effort, of course. Um, furthermore, then open data can play a role in guiding governmental policy. So um, it can be different levels, for instance, in terms of biodiversity data that we uh, need to know, okay, when we, when we, as Daniel already said, we want to have a marine protected reserve. So we need to have these data available to define if we need a reserve and where to, where to draw the boundaries for that reserve. So it's very, very important, of course. And um, furthermore, it also improves the access to research um, data for people outside academia. So we not only think within research, so we also want the data to be accessible to the public, to citizen scientists to um, NGOs, um, anyone who has an interest in those data. And um, we want to make it accessible without paywalls, without needing to be a scientist. So that's also very important. Um, and furthermore, as, we, as you already mentioned, it increases transparency and accessibility, especially in times of fake news and a lot of mistrust against science. We really need that transparency um, and uh, to regain trust in science in a way. Um, so to, to really counter that, that increasing mistrust. Uh, so that's why this is very important to not only publish a paper, but also be transparent about everything which happened before the paper. Then I have to keep moving the window, sorry. <clears throat> um, so then also 
we have benefits at the level of the research community itself. So for the scientists, uh, for the researchers. Um, and there you already mentioned as well. So that's important to have access for reuse and reinterpretation of your data um, so that you can reuse your data and, and gain new insights that can be gained more easily and that lead to new research approaches. So you may have one certain interpretation of your data, but if five, 10 or 20 scientists look at the data again or combine them with other data, you may actually get new insights. You may have different ideas what your data can mean. Uh, and that's why it's important to also make your data available, not only the results of, of your data. Um, and at the same time, it also empowers the scientific community to replicate your experiments. Um, it's particularly common and relevant for, for medical research, especially we really want to know is a certain medicine, a certain vaccine um, really working when you replicate the experiments, um, because that basically also means there can be lives at stake. So we need to be sure that uh, what we find is really true and to replicate those experiments. And then, Furthermore, it also avoids duplication of scientific experiments. So again, relating to the, the point before that we do want to avoid um, rep, no, not replicating, but redoing the same thing um, without a good justification. Um, also, it saves researchers from additional expenses and time. Uh, I would say time is probably the more valuable part here um, by allowing them to use your data. And as, and furthermore, it also improves the robustness and reproducibility and correctness of your results as well, because again, it can be verified by other scientists, by peers. Then the level of the researchers, so like, why is it important for you? Why is it important for us uh, to publish the data? So there has been studies that actually showed that if you publish a data along with your research paper, that you actually attract more citations. Um, and they can be up to 25%, so it's quite significant. And it's simply because the reason um, it, um, people can reuse your, researchers can reuse your data. It also enhances your visibility and discoverability in the scientific community because you also have, because you have a high number of publications, you also um, get more hits when people look up for your research and your research domain. Um, and furthermore, then, Sorry, there are also services uh, like the Data Citation Index or Scolix that uh, promote the cross-referencing of data publications to research articles. Um, so basically there's a cross link between your research publication as well as your data publication by these services. So it's an automatic linking. And that can also boost your, your impact profiles because it just um, increases your visibility in the web. Then you will also have the benefit of having a greater recognition and reputation within the community which potentially may need to lead to new collaborations. Um, and especially because often you have data which you not always end up in a research paper and they just have, have seen so many times they just end up in the drawer and never get published. Um, but if you just publish, so but you can also just publish your data without the paper. Um, and this way you scale up the research output you have. And this potentially also uh, showcases research domains you have not been able to publish yet, and which of course increases your um, your visibility and attracts more collaborations. Um, it also expands your audience, increases the chance of cross disciplinary interests and citations. So as I said, it's also not only within the scientific community, also potentially with um, outside science, you can collaborate um, and and work cross sectional. Um, also, if you're interested in citizen science. You also build these bridges by having open data. Um, and it also improves the transparency at your level um, and the comprehensi comprehensibility of your research work. So because, um, yeah, you, you really show, you have no fear of showing how you, how you produce your data, how your data um, look like, and how at the end also you analyze them to get to your research results. Then, it also provides others to proper means to properly cite your data. Um, because um, normally, of course, you're used to only citing papers, but uh, increasingly data become independent entities. So um, it becomes very important to cite the data separately from your, from your papers as well. And if you publish them, that becomes a possibility. Um, 
as I said already earlier, so you also increase the overall number of publications with the persistent identifier. Um, so, and you probably even publish more data sets than you would publish papers. And it also ensures that you receive the credit you deserve for your work. And that not only means you as a primary uh, publisher, but also for anyone being related to that data collection or data um, creation process. So very often you have also technicians, you have students um, who contribute to producing those data, but often they do not end up on the paper. But I think it's also very fair and necessary that they become, that they get acknowledged in a data publication. So very often you have a much larger list, broader list of authors in a data publication compared to the paper, uh, where you really acknowledge everyone who contributed to collect those data, which I think is very important. So just in a nutshell again, with a potentially increasing order of importance. So you publish data, which Austin mentioned, um, some is just because you have to, your funder tells you or your the, the journal you want to publish and tells you to. Um, you want to reach your data in the future or others. You also want to improve your reputation as a researcher. And you want others to verify your results as well. And one quote would be, the coolest thing to do with your data will be thought of by someone else. So again, um, creating a means to, um, to enhance the impact of your data. So that's probably a very important part. So you get something bigger out of it than uh, you would be able to do alone. So then, the next question would be, so where should we publish our data? Should we do it the old style and just publish it in the library and get it, let it get dusty in the, in the bookshelf and no one's gonna see it except some, uh, some nerdy students. Um, so that's probably not the best way to, to have your data published. Or you want to publish your data that they, get, that they have an access to, um, to five, 10 and more 20 researchers um, to maximize your, in the impact of your data. And especially because Collecting data is a painful, sometimes painful, also fun process, but mostly very tedious. So it would be a shame if they end up in a dusty bookshelf. Um, the main thing is, the main challenge here is, okay, where to publish the data? We have a big agony of choice. Yeah, by now, so many repositories. I mean, if you think 15 years back, that was not, that was actually not much choice, but meanwhile, we have a huge choice of where you can publish your data. And the, the main question is, so which is the right repository for me? So where are I gonna publish? Um, and one very important um, buzzword is FAIR. So I may have heard about this already. So one important factor of choosing a repository is to look for repositories that publish data based on FAIR guidelines. Um, there's a, Milestone paper on this, who introduced those, this term FAIR. Um, and what it actually means is, so FAIR stands for, go back, findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. And findable in particular stands for um, data should be, anyone should be able to find your data. So it's very obvious thing to, to understand from this term. Um, but not only the data itself, also the metadata should be easy to find for humans, but also computers, because increasingly we have machine-based um, approaches to collect data and to analyze data. So it becomes increasingly important that your data also can be understood by machines. Um, and in this context, machine-readable metadata are essential for automatic discovery of data sets and services. So using a certain vocabulary that machines can read is very important to make your data findable. The second aspect would be the A of FAIR, accessible, um, which simply means, so once the user finds your data, they also need to access those data. Um, so it shouldn't be the case that I'll say, okay, you have that great data set, but um, I do not have access because there's a paywall, or I don't have a subscription to a particular repository or journal which, which holds the data as supplement. So, and that is particularly relevant for people who are not in science, who have not an association with the Institute, which covers all those um, accesses. Then next part would be um, interoperable. So that's again, um, pointing at that data need to be integrated with other data. 
And the data need to interoperate with applications or workflows for analysis, storage, and processing. Um, so that basically means that you need um, a certain vocabulary that can be understood across different platforms. So that I think you already mentioned um, in the past days, a standard for instance, like Dublin Core or Darwin Core standard, but it's like a common language, a global language, which can be understood by machines, which can be understood between different repositories so they can easily exchange data. So this way your data become, um, they integrate into a, a global space of, of a data cloud, so to say, uh, where everything can be exchanged easily. And the last part of FAIR would be reusable. So that's the ultimate goal of FAIR is to optimize the reuse of data to maximize the impact of the knowledge. Um, and in this context, it's very important that the metadata of your data are um, well described so that we can, they can be replicated and combined in different settings. And then the main question is, okay, if you look for a repository, how do, we, how do you know that they are fair? Um, because it's not that obvious. Not, not everyone would just write on the main page, we are fair. So um, the good thing is they are different websites. Uh, the best thing once I know is a read three data or fair sharing. So basically they list repositories that are fair. So if you look for a repository based on these principles, you go to these websites and enter your, your topic and your theme and they help you find the right repository. <clears throat> um, other question would be, okay, does your journal, publisher, research area endorse it? So that can also be a hint of uh, they are fair, um, but maybe not 100%. And a very certain thing you can do is and look for is the core trust seal. So the core trust seal is basically uh, a certification for repositories. That's basically um, a, a testing a repository if, it, uh, if it's complying to fair standards. So if you have a repository with a core trust seal, you can be very certain that it's uh, operating under fair standards. Um, so then more aspects in terms of how to find repositories. So you want to also look for, does it actually adhere to the funders requirements? So for instance, there are DG guidelines uh, for handling research data. Um, as for instance, one quote, it says, uh, the relevant explanations must, must contain information about data types, discipline specific standards, and the choice of suitable repositories. So it's a bit um, yeah, wishy-washy actually. Um, I guess in the future to become more specific, um, but there's already a clear guideline that you need to publish at a data repository. Um, <clears throat> uh, for instance, also at the Horizon 2020 is also some, some notes on that, that you need to deposit your data in a research data repository that it's possible for third parties to access, mine, exploit, reproduce, and disseminate. So they need to be open access, basically, and that they're also free of charge. So important aspect. So it's actually more specific than what DFG says here. Um, more quotes from funder requirements are, for instance, that research data, so as also DFG, should be made available as soon as possible. Data should be made accessible at a stage of processing that allows it to be usefully reused by third parties. So actually it's quite similar to Horizon 2020 here. Um, ensure that access to the data is still guaranteed um, when research data are transferred to a third party and long-term archiving, which is also a very important aspect. So you need to know um, <clears throat> if uh, the repository provides an infrastructure that uh, can guarantee you that the data are stored for more than 10 years. Because you don't want your data to be to expire because the repository is going bankrupt or it's just <clears throat> they close the server. So that's an, another important aspect you want to consider. Um, the other part would be very fundamental. So it doesn't actually accept my data because you produce a lot of different types of data. Um, and we need to know do they accept those data? So we need to check uh, what the repository actually accepts. Um, some are more stricter than others. Um, in terms of, so there are general repositories that accept almost anything and some are more strict in terms of the scope and the data types. Um, sometimes you wanna see, does it provide the functionality you wanna have for your data in terms of the display, in terms of the interactions you can have? Um, can it handle the size? So sometimes you have video data, audio data that can be 100 gigabyte and more. Um, and that and then pretty quickly actually hit a limit there for many repositories that actually just strictly say, we do not accept more than five gigabyte or um, 10 gigabyte or some, or even so some, they do not accept more than hundred megabyte. 
Um, and furthermore, also can it handle the structure of your data set? So the way you actually structure your data, it may not always fit. Um, <clears throat> there's just some, uh, some examples, for instance, GBIF, they have some, um, <clears throat> some certain requirements here, how they uh, want your data. And they have different types of data you can submit. For instance, you have checklist data, you have occurrence data, you also have sampling event data. And along with it, they also require you to provide a couple of metadata which you need to provide when you submit. Um, and they, for instance, they, they like to see tab or common delimited uh, text files um, and also in a certain encoding style, which is also important, which is often not uh, recognized when you submit. Um, yeah, another thing as well, you want to see, does, it, does the repository have an impact and is it visible to the research community or the, to, the, to your target community? So is it popular and well known? Do we users normally use this database? So it's gonna be probably your peers in your field and you they often they have um, favorite databases where they get the data from. So you probably wanna make sure that you publish your data in this specific um, database to just reach your target audience. Um, and maybe also does it integrate well with common tools? So if you have a community that basically automatically retrieves data via R or Python or whatever, um, do they also have an integration of such tools, for instance? Um, furthermore, it's also about does it support the relevant metadata? Um, because metadata help you uh, help your help your data to be easily found. Um, and some discipline specific repositories have some very specific features that really add value to your data set. So the repositories that are very simple, they basically just show me the title and the abstract and just link or download link to your data set. And some have just more functionality. For instance, Pangea, we have like, like, like for instance, we show your data uh, collection points on a map. Um, and you can also um, get, for instance, when you click on an author, you can get more information about ORCID and your uh, emails and, and linking your projects to European project funding and all that. So there's a lot of interaction in build. So it really depends on what you want to have. Um, and again, to the point, um, how long are the data available? So how re reliable is the long-term um, storage of your data? And for this, you have to see how is the repository managed? Is it managed by a private company, by society, an institution, or even the government? Um, that gives you some idea how how long it may be, how stable the funding may be for that repository, because data storage is, is, is an expensive expensive thing to do. Um, yeah, and especially if it has a long-term access for more than 10 years. And that's also a criterion which is um, checked by the core trust here. The next part would be, is it accessible? So again, I mentioned that with the FAIR principles. Um, so that's more in terms of also the public access to open access licenses. Um, so um, again, then logins required or paywalls. Does it support the open, uh, the common or like the uh, creative common licenses, for instance? Um, or does it charge you something for uploading the data? So not all the repositories are for free. Some actually charge you money for it. So again, a lot of criteria to check. Um, you can often feel. Uh, that's the way it felt to me that I'm a bit lost in repositories um, because I just didn't know. But with just some examples and some factors you should look out for to, to select a repository. Um, and again, there are these lists of websites, um, which I also mentioned two of them beforehand, but you can also check Open Door. And sometimes uh, there's also one link for, to Nature, which also lists a couple of repositories, uh, which are a good way to start to find the, the right repository. So now we come to the first practice. I think I talked quite a bit already. Um, so in this exercise, we want to find uh, a repository based on these different criteria. So in this exercise, uh, we have breakout groups. Um, I think we just allocate, would be then four people in each group, I guess, um, allocated randomly. Um, and then we go to the data repository table. So I'm just going to post a link in the chat as well. So I prepared a, a Google sheet here where with different, you can see the sheet, right? Okay. Uh, we just um, look up here, what's my group number? And then you just specifically go to the corresponding repository. So group one would deal with GBIF and group two with Figshare and so on. 
and they just paste in the URL and um, look out for, okay, in the about section, what's the research domain the field? Then you check maybe how popular among is it about for reusers, so maybe in your own field, your specific field, is it used very often or not? Um, I think in a survey, you also gave us some feedback and a lot of you published sometimes, some published in Dryad, some in, in Fiction and so on, I think one in Pangea. Uh, so you can rate that. Um, does it cost anything? You can check that. Does it fulfill the funder requirements? For instance, the ones I mentioned from DFG, you can also maybe refer to your own funder. Um, is the output suitable? That's more like a subjective thing. So do you think, do you like it? Do you think it has nice features? Just give it a rating. Um, how accessible are the data? Is it open, closed, restricted, or do you have an embargo option? Um, is it listed on 3.3 data? So in terms of the, the fair, the fair fact factors uh, or at fair sharing? Um, is it certified? So does it have a core trust seal? Does it have a data policy? Um, does it guarantee long-term access? So there are many different factors. You do not have to fill out everything. It's just basically something uh, for you to get started. And that's something you can have on your on your private laptop uh, and all the time you look for a repository, you basically have a list of things you can just look for and, and use to rate the repository based on these factors. So that's the exercise. Um, I post the link, one second. You let me know if you can access it. Should be the sharing one, hopefully. And you can uh, basically already use those websites. So you can also post those links to do the research. Because the nice part about these websites is, that you can basically go there. And let's say end up on here. And then it gives you a hit for matching database. You can also just look for biology, right? So you can end up biology. And then it finds everything that, which has a keyword biology in there. Uh, and there are lots. So and once you find something, you can click on it and you can already see some tags here in terms of, okay, is it open access? You can already draw a lot of information from these short little icons here. Uh, but you can also click into that and see these different information. So we get the URL, get the subject area, a short description. Um, you can see also Pangea has a core trust seal already. Um, you can see it's also listed at fair sharing, has a DUI there as well. Um, then you get a lot more details uh, which are relevant for you. So it's a really easy way for you to, to find out information on what those databases. The next exercise would be that we now um, have a look at the actual data publication of the different repositories. Uh, so you're basically gonna have breakout groups again, and we will look at different ways the data publications can look like. So we have a, I prepared a little uh, Google slide presentation. We have again our groups. Um, and then each group has again a particular repository. And there you have a title linked to a data set. So not just to the repository, but a particular data set. So you can click on the title. Um, I just share the link. One second. And there you just follow that link and go to the data set. And then you can basically see data set. Um, and in that data set, you basically look for, okay, um, what features does it have? So like just uh, how the way the data is presented. So in terms of, okay, it has a title, uh, I can see it has um, a map, for instance, it has an occurrence record. Um, then for instance, um, yeah, does it have certain metadata you find interesting? Uh, here, for instance, has, it shows a license and all these kind of things. So just check generally what features the data set has, and then each group does it for their own data set. So for instance, then um, Donald Dryer would have a different, a very different outline. So we get a basically a comparison. So what you can do is you can also just take a screenshot, um, paste it into your presentation, um, not more than four slides, and you should have not have more than two minutes for a presentation, um, and compare that. And 
You can also then write, okay, what is it what you really like about the way the data are presented? And what do you think is maybe missing? Maybe something you would really like to see, but it's not there. Um, and you have about, um, for the instructions on the first slide, about um, uh, 10 minute time to prepare in a group. And after that, you just meet back in the main room and then the five groups have each two minute presentations, just very shortly, easy. Um, and to get a comparison for everyone, how these different um, data publications can look across these different repositories. Yeah, so um, the last few slides are gonna be about persistent identifiers, and what they actually are. Um, so what are persistent identifiers? You already talked about this in the morning. So they're unique identifiers like your number on the passport. Um, and they're good because uh, they're permanently linked to all related information, so your metadata. So on a passport, you can use that ID and you know what's your first name, what's your last name, where you're born, and so on. So it's very useful just having this one single code to get all the additional information for any record. Um, important is also that PRDs are, so persistent identifiers are created and maintained by central agencies that guarantee the persistence and importantly, the uniqueness of each ID. Um, so that your tax office, um, your, the city council, that they all make sure they are stored for long term and that is only one record connected to each ID. Um, important is also that they're machine readable in terms of the research context. Uh, they can use, be used by external services or for instance, big data harvesting. Um, and one good thing is also that PID support all aspects of fair data. <clears throat> So persistent identifiers in science, we already talked about ORCID to have the unique ID for you as researchers. Um, there are also many other PIDs, uh, for instance, for institutions, they are they're called RAW. Uh, for funders, we have Crossref, for samples, for instance, um, an IGSN number. Um, worms itis, I think you talked about already in this in this winter school for organisms, so like for worms, an AF, um, AFIA ID, and for itis, a TSN number. Um, and of course, publications, they also have their own DOIs. Um, the benefit is you can automatically link the different scientific outputs um, in a sort of an ecosystem. So you can link the author to all the different papers. You can link the author to the institution where they're affiliated to, uh, to the funders and so on. So it becomes very handy to automatically connect all these different entities with a PID. Just to give an example, so for Pangea, for instance, they can actually um, go there. He has already said we have a PID here, hidden there. So you can have an ORCID and you click on it and you end up on the ORCID page of that author. And then you get all these different information, all the papers linked to that author. So it's a very handy thing, but just linking, like, linking this in your data publication record. Um, another example could be, okay, here we have, for instance, funding information and here we have um, a funding ID. So you can click on that and for instance, you get directed to a CORDIS website for the European Commission. Um, and that, load, that site would load, it would be handy. Um, yeah, and there you have a landing page where you have um, the description of a certain, of this project um, and all other information. Interesting part here, for instance, would be, um, for instance, under results, that you have also, um, the publications listed, which are listed here, which all relate to the to the to the project, for instance, and um, and also here the data sets. For instance, you click here uh, on the data set are housed by Open Air, so it basically looks for data sets that are related to the project, which basically have this particular ID number, and automatically lists all these publications. So you can see all these data uh, data publications are linked to this project. So without the PID this would not be possible. So you can see it gets interlinked and your data become uh, correspond to the FAIR principles, become FAIR and they actually gain visibility because they're interlinked to so many different websites. You get better hits and you really increase the impact of your data publication by just having all these different kind of linking opportunities via PIDs, very handy. So just as a glimpse again, the snapshot of what I just said. Um, just one last survey. Um, do we have an ORCID ID? Cool, that's great. So the majority, a large majority has an ORCID ID, that's great. I actually thought it's gonna show a percentage, but unfortunately not, it was probably about uh, more than 80% for sure. So that's great. The people who have no here, 
use the time to create an orchid, use the break to create an orchid. <laughs> and the other ones you have, maybe it's also some good um, opportunity to also check your record, everything's up to date. If your affiliation is still up to date and your publications, so yeah, very important um, and good thing to have for your next startup publication.